Hello, my name is Dr. Cotty, and today we are going to be talking about mental health frameworks and theories. The objectives for this lecture are to define mental health and mental illness, to discuss the major components of the major developmental theories, including Erickson's theory of psychosocial development, Pavlov, Watson, and Pavlov's nursing model of interpersonal development, also to discuss the various therapies and approaches for addressing mental health issues and to define laws and ethics pertinent to the treatment of clients with mental disorders. When we think about mental health, you might want to ask yourself, what does mental health mean to you? So for a lot of people, mental health means autonomy, independence, self-acceptance, satisfaction with life, progression toward growth, self-realization, and a good perception of reality. Healthy relationships and healthy coping tools, tools when dealing with stress might also come to mind. Problem solving capabilities and the ability to think logically. These are things that you might think of when you think of mental health. Mental health is a successful adaptation to stressors from the internal or external environment evidenced by thoughts, feelings, and behaviors that are age appropriate and congruent for local and cultural norms. Mental illness is maladaptive responses to stressors from the internal or external environment evidenced by thoughts, feelings, and behaviors that are incongruent with the local and cultural norms and that interfere with the individual's social, occupational, and or physical functioning. Mental illness is not a weakness or lack of character. It can occur across the lifespan and have genetic predisposition. It can disrupt the way the individuals think, but most mental illness is treatable with therapy, medication, or both. Approximately one in four people have mental health issues in the United States, and there is no one theory to explain mental illness. Again, when we're talking about framework and theories, no one theory explains everything. So mental health and mental illness can be influenced by biological factors, psychological, interpersonal factors, and sociocultural factors. But theories have been the backbone of psychiatry since the mid 1900s. On the next slide, you're going to see a link that takes you to a video discussing the theory of, the theory of neuroplasticity. I hope that you take time to watch it. Young brains are more influenced by environmental input and healthy environments support mental health. Another key point that you might know is that depression in older adults may be, may be frequent, but it's not normal. This link shows a quick video on the theory of neuroplasticity. It's also in our playlist. So now let's talk about the word stigma. Stigma is an ancient Greek term. It meant a mark placed on individuals to identify slaves, so individuals who had a lesser value. So when we think of mental health stigma, we not only think of what the public's opinion are or is of, men, of individuals with mental health diagnoses, but we also think of self stigma. So people with mental illness can think they are unworthy of care. It's not only public stigma. But sometimes society really does treat mental illness differently. I've worked at a lot of psychiatric hospitals, and there was one hospital where when you pulled up, if you were a patient with cancer, you got valet parking, and you walked into this lobby with soaring ceilings to hear piano playing. There was an art room and a coffee shop and a rooftop cafe and even a meditation room. But every patient, no matter what the reason they were there in the emergency room for, entered the psychiatric hospital the same way. And that is they went from a locked unit in the emergency room through the back doors and a sea of robots. And these robots were shuffling equipment all around the basement of the hospital. Then you went by the prisoners, which were being kept in what looked like cages and being guarded by police through another door. And you took an elevator where when the door shut, literally had handprints on it, and it was a very filthy elevator, down to the basement. 
when you left that elevator in the basement, it was steaming hot pipes. And that's where the heat was for the hospital. And you went through this very long tunnel that was steaming hot, often filled with cockroaches, past the morgue. So there was one sign that read morgue and one sign that read autopsies. And then you entered the psychiatric hospital. Once you entered the psychiatric hospital, you went up a little incline through a sea of trash and to another set of dirty elevators. And when you got to the locked unit, you were strip searched and everything was taken from you. And so when we're thinking about mental health stigma, think about what message individuals are getting from society when they are treated this way. And think about why people with mental illness may think that they are unworthy of care or they might have self stigma. When we're talking about mental health stigma, I want you to compare and contrast the two differences between an individual who has to miss work for a medical issue or for an individual who has to miss work for a psychiatric issue. So if somebody's fully employed, has their own apartment, enjoys hobbies, has a concerned parent, but has diabetes, they may require repeated hospitalizations for acute flare-ups, and they may need time to recover. But they usually go back to work, back to their apartment, back to their hobbies, and their friends and social life. Because of stigma, when an individual with schizophrenia, for example, leaves the hospital, they often lose their job. They don't return to their employment. And prior to hospitalization, they may live in their own apartment, also have hobbies, also have concerned parents. They also need hospitalized many times for acute flare ups and they need time to recover. But because of stigma surrounding schizophrenia, they lose their job. Then they lose their apartment and their hobbies and their friends and often live an isolated life. When we look at this slide, this is a picture of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and the citation can be found on the bottom right. So if you're thinking about Maslow's hierarchy of needs as a pyramid, you see that psychological needs such as air, water, food, shelter, sleep, clothing, ability to reproduce, those come first. Those are the most basic needs. Next are needs for safety, so personal security, employment, resources, health, and then we can achieve love and belonging. So a family and a sense of connection, friendships. Next on the pyramid is esteem. So this includes respect, self-esteem, status, recognition, strength, freedom. And finally is self-actualization. That's the very top of the pyramid. And this is the desire to become the most that you can be. So the most basic needs require fulfillment first and self-actualization is the fulfillment of one's highest potential. Now an individual may go up or down on the pyramid depending on life circumstances. An individual by the name of Horwitz states that cultural influences affect how individuals view mental illness. So normal behaviors are defined by a culture. This is called cultural relativity. So normal or abnormal behavior is determined by the culture, cultural relativity. And the term incomprehensibility refers to the inability of the general population or public to understand the motivation behind an individual's questionable behaviors. Now let's talk about levels of prevention. So primary, secondary, tertiary levels of prevention, you're going to see this over and over as a nurse, um, especially on the NCLEX, so please pay attention. Primary prevention, we want to teach an individual before the problem starts. So we want to focus on stress reduction, say a caregiver or parenting class. The individual 
who is having primary prevention is going to learn how to cope, and that may be through classes or therapy. And we also wanted to limit trauma. Secondary level of prevention would include screenings. So a screening would be to detect or find the disability. So in this case, it would be the mental health disability, mental illness. Tertiary level of pre prevention means that we're going to treat the individual. So these mental health interventions may include support groups, rehabilitation services, medication, more intensive therapy, perhaps hospitalization, and psychosocial rehabilitation may include assisting with employment so the individual has more independence and can engage in meaningful relationships. And we also would focus on community integration. So now let's talk about continuum of care and what do we mean by that? Well, when an individual has a mental illness, sometimes they need care. So they need help with their mental illness. There are self-help groups, community mental health organizations. Sometimes if an individual needs a lot of help, they might have case management, partial hospitalization programs. And those programs are usually day long therapy programs that last roughly from 8 a.m. until 4 p.m. for a set number of weeks, say three to four weeks. So the person doesn't need to spend the night at the hospital, but they could benefit from more intensive therapy. That'd be partial hospitalization program. IOP would be intensive outpatient, and those are usually three evenings a week from say five to 8 p.m. Residential care could be long-term home care to help administer medicine and hospitalization is when the individual is a danger to either themselves or others. Obviously, this is limited in availability and quite expensive. And so this is only for individuals who could harm themselves or someone else. Now, when we're thinking about hospitalization, that might be voluntarily that the patient goes willingly because they're asking for help or involuntarily, they do not want to go. And when it is involuntary, the individual is pink slipped. So that's the Ohio Revised Code 5122, Section 5122.05, involuntary admission. So when a person is reported to have homicidal or suicidal ideation or attempts and is unable to care for themselves and is a danger to themselves or others, a person can be held for three business days for observation. And we call that a pink slip. And that's literally because the paper that it was written on used to be pink. So once hospitalized, that person will have a multidisciplinary team. And the goal is always to keep the patient in the least restrictive environment. So once they are no longer a danger to themselves, they would be discharged. Now, who would be on that multidisciplinary team? Well, you would have a nurse. Um, you will have a resident, often a psychiatrist. You may have medical doctors if they have medical complications, caseworkers, there might be art therapists, group therapy. It'll be an entire team of people working to provide them with the best, most comprehensive care in the least restrictive environment possible. And again, the goal of hospitalization is to be in the least restrictive environment. So voluntary, a person self-reports that they're feeling homicidal or have suicidal ideation and intent, and they want protection. They don't want to actually act on these thoughts. So if a person is pink slipped, they might just be reported to have HI, which is homicidal ideation, or SI, suicidal ideation, and they are unable to care for themselves or are a danger to themselves or others. The person can be held for three business days for observation. Now, weekends and holidays don't count. They, the person then can either sign in and agree to get treatment or they can go to probate court. Often here, our probate court is held at Twin Valley and the hearings um, historically have been on Wednesdays or Fridays. Again, here are the members of the multi multidisciplinary team.
psychiatrist, and then there underneath the psychiatrist is usually a physician's assistant, a nurse practitioner, or a resident. They might see a psychologist, but that's not very likely. They might have a case manager, a nurse, a patient care assistant, a PCA, an occupational or, occupational or physical therapist. There is often a recreational therapist, an art therapist, and individuals who, re, who lead group therapies.